Jake and Eggnog are playing cards in Quarks, and overhear Rom getting torn a new one for an ordering error. He's bought a load of cardigan sauce, but they're the only ones who like it, and they're not exactly frequent visitors anymore, what with the whole subjugating the local population for decades thing and all. Eggnog thinks this might be a chance for profit, though we're not told if it's to help his dad or line his own pockets. Depends how much influence Jake has had on him, I guess. Let's stow that for now and move to Ops. We're watching the Bajorans drill into the molten core of a moon to exploit its energy and have a worried minister with us. Maybe he's worried because the Federation are helping out, and he's seen our track record on science shenanigans. Maybe Kira's had the same thought too, which is why she and Dax are going for an inspection of the moon's surface. A check to make sure there's nothing awry finds somebody down there, and not the scientists who are trying to poke it. Kira decides on a closer look and discovers some pleasant greenery. It's quite idyllic, really, as long as you're willing to ignore the bit where you get threatened by people with farming implements. The two are called off by a third, which means he has influence in his prime naming material. We'll be referring to him as... Vance Van Van der Van, offered by Lieutenant Red Sable. Vance says uniforms aren't popular in these parts, hence the welcome. He's somewhat less stabby, though, after she butters him up a bit, and listens to her tell him they must have been missed during the evacuation of this presumably once-inhabited moon. Vance Van Van der Van's in no hurry to leave, despite Kira's urgency, though he's willing to talk about it over supper. Eggnog's been looking into the source problem and thinks he has a solution. There's a ship captain who trades with the cardigans regularly, and he's interested. A slight problem, he doesn't have the five bars of latinum Eggnog wants. In fact, he doesn't have any latinum. What he does have is 100 gross of self-sealing stem bolts, the buyer for which has stiffed him. Eggnog's not delighted by the idea, but Jake thinks they should take it. If nothing else, at least bolts aren't going to start rotting if they don't find a buyer. Now all they have to do is figure out how to get the source, and where they're going to put nearly 150,000 bolts. While they deal with their logistical issues, we'll check up on Kira. Supper's going to take a while, so she calls Dax and tells her to carry on without her, and she'll bum a lift from the scientists. Time for a chat, and we learn from Vance Van Van der Van that his companions don't talk due to undefined cardigan unpleasantness, and they scarpered here nearly two decades back. He's been here more than twice as long after escaping from the Cardigans himself, breaking his way out of a labour camp on what he calls Your Precious Bajor. This moon is all he's known for half his life, and that's why he has no intention of leaving, Cortap or no Cortap. It's night time on the moon, and Vance Van Van der Van's house is lit up like a Christmas tree, which raises some questions about how it was missed on previous checks, but let's ignore that for now. The supper is finally finished cooking, and Vance is telling the story of how he ended up here. Story is perhaps the best description too, as it's fair to say he's embellishing certain aspects of it to the point of parody. I'm sure none of us watching can understand what it's like to cover trauma with comedy. He jokes too about Kira's experiences fighting the cardigans, saying it must have been fun. She rises to the bait and tells him about the hardship and determination, refusing to give up in the face of overwhelming odds, then realises what he's doing, making her see his position here. Being told the air will be made unbreathable by what's going to happen isn't enough to convince him either. What's a little thing like overwhelming odds to Bajorans? No, they can do what they want, but him? He'll be right here, working on his farm. Eggnog managed to get hold of the source by making Quark annoyed enough about it to want rid, so that means he's now the proud owner of a shed load of bolts. What do they do? Who knows? Not even O'Brien can say what they're for, and he knows enough engineering to keep a space station built out of string and cardboard running. Still, Eggnog's got them, and that's a start. He thinks he might be able to sell them to the original buyer at a knockdown price, which seems like a great way to not get what they're worth in my opinion, but any return at this point is 100% profit, so maybe he's on to something. To ops we go, and Kira is back from her trip, alone. We give that minister from the start of the show the bad news about the moon not being abandoned. Being told Vance Van Van der Van won't leave of his own free will doesn't seem to concern the minister too much. We'll just relocate him anyway. All the others left of their own free will, well, probably, and this is a very important infrastructure project. 
I mean, okay, there's a way of doing it that won't permanently turn the atmosphere toxic, but that would take literally a year to do, and they want the energy now. A few old geezers being stubborn asses shouldn't get in the way of that, so we'll just remove them by force. This is all starting to sound a bit cardigan to Kira, and she says as much with a predictable result from the minister. Nobody likes being compared to their enemies, and even less so when it's true, so he pulls rank and orders her to do it, or be replaced. Kira's back on the moon and has brought some associates. They go off to gather up Vance van van der Van's friends while she tries to deal with him. He's ignoring the situation again, telling her tales while he works on building a kiln, but she's not here for more lessons. As she goes off to pack his things herself, she's stopped by shouting from her associates. One of them's gained some new holes and isn't best pleased. Not as displeased as Vance is when he sees his friends are being restrained, and he wades in too. Wrestling leads to pooping, leads to Vance lying on the floor, and Kira tells Guy with new holes to go and call for Bashir. Let's catch up with the side plot, shall we? Eggnog's calling the guy who wanted all those bolts while doing a science to hide their identities by making it look like interference. The buyer who didn't have any money before has, surprisingly, not got any money now either. What they do have is some land. Eggnog's getting pretty tired of this whole thing playing out like a chain of fetch quests from an MMO. Jake, on the other hand, sees this as an upgrade, possibly because land doesn't need a place to store it. The deal concludes, leaving two kids on a space station the proud owners of a part of Bajor. I do hope there aren't any legal fees for the transfer. Bashir's tending Vance van van der Van. He's not great after taking a shot to the Norks, but he'll live. He's certainly well enough to inquire about his friends, and is told they've been evacuated to Bajor. It's his turn now, though, to Deep Space Nine for medical treatment. Vance tells him to balls, so he instead leaves the house to talk to Kira. He tells her he's going to take Vance against his will as he needs treatment, and she tells him to balls too. She'll stay here with whatever meds he needs and tend him herself. She can do it after she's helped to build the kiln he was working on. Bashir reports everything back to Sisko, who decides to cover for her. Bashir's recommendation that she stay there for a few days, dictated to him by Sisko, should be sufficient for the paperwork. Still, perhaps a personal visit would be in order as well. Kira's tending Vance van van der Van while being angry, maybe at him, maybe at the situation, maybe at herself. Probably all three. Sisko's arrival isn't exactly celebrated, firstly by Kira on a call, and then by Vance, who insists on getting the door himself. He tries telling Sisko to jog on, and says Kira feels the same way, causing her to intervene. There's a bit of Vance being ornery before he goes back inside to let them talk. She goes to work on the kiln again while Sisko sets out his argument, one that essentially boils down to, I understand, but he's already lost no matter what you do. What purpose does joining him serve? Jake and Eggnog are bickering over a game of cards. Having land is all well and good, but they haven't got a clue what to do with it. A curious thing, though, Odo's here and asking Quark about the company name that Eggnog thought up when they took ownership of the land. Apparently the Bajoran government wants to build a new something or other, and it partly runs along land that recently changed hands. That's quite the potential for whoever owns it now, and as Quark has his fingers in everything, Odo thought he might know about it. Not yet, he says, but he plans on making it his business. Once Odo has left, Quark's ready to hack into the computer to find out who it is, only for Eggnog to make it unnecessary. He has some land to sell, and for the very reasonable price of five bars of latinum. I'd have had Quark sell it in my place for a 25% commission personally, but I guess that's not quite as narratively pleasing. There are conclusions too at Vance van van der Van's home. Kira's woken by noise outside, her having been up for much of the night tending Vance and listening to his nightmares about something unpleasant happening to a woman with a different name to his friend from earlier. She goes outside to find him working on the now nearly completed kiln and helps him to finish it. He lights it as she returns to the house, and comes out with a large bag and bedroll, things that she did not bring with her. He knows what she's doing, but repeats that he won't leave as long as he has a home here. That doesn't leave her a lot of choice if she intends to do her job. The kiln explodes when hit by her shot, and the torch she lights from its ruins does an alarmingly good job of setting fire to his house. 
He asks her to finish the job of destroying his life by using the gun on him, a request born of either resignation or fear at having to face his past. She instead orders them teleported away, and will leave Kira to question quite what her actions make her until the next adventure. The good of the many. I've had people quoting that at me here on the channel before to excuse murder, and it remains as utterly soulless as it did then. Kira's acting for the good of the many here. Energy from this project will heat thousands of homes this winter. Okay, they could probably have found another way for a year until the non-destructive method of extracting energy could come online, but why do that when it's only 50 people? The good of the many. You know who else could make that claim? The Cardigans. Occupying just a single planet to exploit its resources might seem a little distasteful, but they've got a whole union to run with a number of star systems. There are far more Cardigans than there are Bajorans, which means they're entirely right in doing what they did. Good of the many and all that. I guess that makes the Borg's actions acceptable too, what with there being trillions of them. Okay, the people they assimilate didn't agree to it, but then Vance didn't sign up for getting eminent domained back to the Bajor Collective either, so it's all the same, really. I'm being slightly facetious here, I'll grant you, but the balance of personal liberty and societal good is a very thorny topic indeed. Too far one way, and anyone with a uniform can do whatever they want and claim it's to benefit the masses. Too far the other, and your town gets invaded by bears because everybody thinks throwing their rubbish on the floor is sticking it to the man. So was Kira a uniform taking what was wanted for the greater good, or was she just a bear teaching Vance that choosing to be willfully ignorant of outside factors does nothing to prevent their consequences? All of which is to say this episode is thoroughly enjoyable, providing your idea of Trek is ethics and politics rather than pew-pew and kabooms. I can see how some might be dissatisfied with the lack of definitive conclusion, but that's the whole point in my opinion. Sometimes there just isn't one. To that end, everyone does good work at making the whole situation feel utterly wretched, and Brian Keith makes for a delightfully ornery old git, too. It's all well written, with the scene where Vance is having nightmares being a particularly good example of subtle storytelling. He's restless, a dream about someone hurting a woman, and calls out a name. To those not paying attention to names, it sounds like he's simply reliving what happened earlier. To those who note it's different to the name of his neighbour, it explains both his past and his actions when he attacked the security guard. I'd have probably dropped the lines about it being bad memories and asking if he said anything personally in order to keep it even more subtle, but it wouldn't surprise me to learn those were added later by someone else. Or maybe I'm just trying to be generous after liking this one so much. It's no secret that I enjoy my trek with a generous helping of moral ambiguity, and this episode provides just that. Nobody really wins in this one, and all involved in the main plot come out of it looking a bit worse than they did before. For my money, that probably makes it the best episode of the season to date. End of episode. I don't suppose you've got an harmonica. What? Harmonica. It's what you do when you're in prison, isn't it? Playing harmonica. We are not in prison. We are in a holding cell. Same difference. Anyway, where would I be keeping a harmonica? Well, we can have that conversation if you want, but it's not going to end well. Sigh. No, I don't have a harmonica. Metal cup to rattle against the bars? There aren't any bars. I can rattle it against the wall. No, I don't have a metal cup. Uh, wicked make prison wine in the bog? We are not in prison. Anyway, there isn't a toilet. You what? There's no toilet. Oh. Oh dear. Woof.